you know, I've had the privilege, um, I can't even believe it's been nearly 15 years. I must have come to it as a child. Um, of, of leading this incredible organisation um, with an incredible team of people and an incredible team of, of trustees with an incredible partnership that we've had with Life Central for all of that time. And um, we work with children and young people, support them through some of the most difficult times and periods of their life. And I just want to set a background for you, really, just to, to put you in... in um, <laughs> I'd like to say, these aren't going to be uplifting statistics. I'm just warning you now. Um, but I just need to put you in, in a framework and a backdrop of exactly where Face Trust sits. There are around you know, um, 67,900 6, children, young people, aged 0 to 18 in this borough that we live in. Um, that's about 22% of the total population of our area. Um, and the majority of those will receive the care and the nurture and the support that they need um, from their family and their extended family, which is absolutely awesome. But for the others, but for the others, this is a window into their world. And some of the stats are going to come up on the screen. Now, there were over 13,000 contacts with children's services um, up to April 2018. 3,788 of those required input by social care. That means that nearly a third of all the contacts needed some kind of safeguarding help. And of those concerns, the top one was neglect. Was neglect. And that will be quite a feature in the story that we're looking at later on. Do you know, there are currently, uh, well, there were currently then, um, 662 children being looked after by our local authority. There are an average of 22 children are reported as missing from home to the police every month. Every month. There are over 600 households in our borough um, that have children and young people that are regularly witnessing domestic abuse. There are 99 young people that were classed as being at risk of child sexual exploitation. I could go on and on with mental health disorders and alcohol and drug dependency and those getting more and more involved in gun and knife crime. And this is the world in which FaZe works. And we believe, you know, that every single child and young person that we work with has value. Whether they believe it or not, and it's part of our role and part of our job to show them that. And so it's so great to have a day and a weekend like this where we can celebrate 20 years of what we've done. Because that's been 20 years where children and young people have had that kind of messaging put into their lives. And as you saw, over 17,000 individuals. And for the last few weeks, haven't we, we've been looking at the topic of, of living your best life. And, um, and what that means, other than what the media would tell us about, you know, drinking green smoothies or going on holidays with the best views or, or always taking a picture to post when you're in the gym and you're looking your best. You know, I, my, my um, you know, social media feed is full of those pictures, not. Um, why would you want to show that? I never understand why you want to show you. Well, yeah, I'm just digging myself a hole there. Because um, that's living life to the full, isn't it? That's living life to the full. But those tips that we see are mainly focused on around ourselves, aren't they? Um, but I think that truly living our best life involves others. And that's why we're going to talk today about living beyond yourself. Living beyond yourself. And um, came across an article recently that asked, asked what people want to be remembered for the most. And you know what the top answers were? It wasn't about going on your best holiday. It wasn't the girl who always had quinoa for lunch. I'm so glad I pronounced that properly. Uh, I do love a bit of quinoa. Um, but the top thing was this. Is one guy said, I want to be remembered as a person who always helped others who could make a difference in my world. And do you know why I think that was? It's because as a human being, our two biggest needs are to contribute and connect. Are to contribute and connect. And Jesus knew and taught this better than anyone. And before I dive into what that actually looks like for us this morning, we're going to see a video now about somebody who learned to actually what it means to live beyond themselves. This is Charlene's story. My name 
name is Charlene. I am the exploitation lead worker at Phase Trust um, and I've been here now for 10 years. 10 years ago, I stumbled across Phase really, trying to look for a placement at uni. Um, I contacted a few different people. They couldn't help me, but someone suggested Phase Trust. I remember my first meeting with Vicky to get to know each other a little bit and to see if that was what they could offer. We met in Weatherspoons in Hales Owen and I remember her saying to me, you know, FaZe is a faith-based organisation, is that okay with you? Um, I didn't really know what that meant, if I'm perfectly honest. I was quite open-minded about faith, I believed in God, but I didn't really know what it meant to be a Christian in that sense. So working with FaZe, I soon um, got to know what that meant to them. They didn't look down on me for living any differently. At the time, I um, had dropped out of my first uni course. I had a toddler. I was living with my boyfriend. But they didn't make me feel that that meant I wasn't good enough to work with them. Instead, they were open about their faith, what that meant to them. But more importantly, they demonstrated to me what that meant and the work that they did. So FaZe would work with some of the most vulnerable young people in the borough and not only walked with them, but they truly loved them and wanted the best for them, no matter how difficult they were and even if they didn't agree with what they were doing at that time. So through this journey with FaZe, um, several people invited me to different events at church. It wasn't that I didn't want to go, I didn't really know what to expect. I was worried that I didn't know enough to be a Christian. I didn't know enough about the Bible or I knew that I wasn't living in the way that I was expected to. But I gave in. I went to an evening event um, in March 2011. And during that evening, I couldn't think of any reason at all to say, you know, to say no. I had every reason to say yes to God. And looking back in that moment, I can see how my life's changed and that night was incredible. But really what brought me to God was the relationships that I built with FaZe and with volunteers that I'd met, you know, that were going to Zion at the time. It now really shows me how I do the work that I do with FaZe. I work with um, young people that are still the most vulnerable in the borough. Phase work with exploited young people. Um, a lot of the people that I work with are, are at risk of or are being exploited sexually. I don't have the chance to sit with them and share the gospel or read out Bible studies and, and, and quotes to them about how to change their life or even pray with them unless I'm invited to. But what I can do is tell them what God wants to tell them, and that is that they are loved, that they are worthy, that they are beautifully made, um, no matter how they're taught that in a different way. You know, these are some of the young people that are abused by who they see are people much more powerful than them. I just hope that at some point during their journey in the future, they will realise that it's God that's change their life. I don't change it. God just gives me the patience and the strength to work with those young people. So, you know, mo moving on in terms of my journey, I have been baptised um, at then Zion, um, married my now husband, who was my boyfriend then, and our family is part of FaZe and Life Central. <music>
Um, we're going to look at a story that many of you will know. It's the Good Samaritan story. Um, you've probably heard it 30 or 40 times, but, but I'm hoping that, that God will show you something different out of this this morning. And the Bible verse is going to come up on the screen. And it's found in, in Luke chapter 10. And verse 25 says this. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this guy asks really the most important question, probably the most asked question that anybody's ever going to ask you. How do you know if you're going to heaven? That's basically what he said. How do you know if you're going to heaven? Secondly, he's not being sincere here. This is another test for Jesus. And verse 26 says this. What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. This is a big ask, you know. Love God supremely. Make God the highest passion in your heart. The one you think about first and you think about last. The undisputed winner of your affections. You should care more, he's saying to this guy, about pleasing him than anything else or anyone else in your life. And then, and love everybody as you love yourself. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, care about others' needs as much as you care about your own. Be happy when they're happy. Worry when they worry. Cry with their hurts just as much as you do your own. Isn't this how we live every day? Here's the dilemma for this guy. Dilemma number one. How do you command that? How do you command love? You see, love is the kind of thing, isn't it, I think, that you either feel naturally or you don't. You know, if I already love something, I don't need to be communicated to or told to love it. So, for example, dipping bread in yogurt, I love it. Love it. You're all, ugh. love it. Love it, love it. A good Chinese banquet. There you go. Looking after my godsons, you know, going to sleep. I love going to sleep. <laughs> my husband, he put that in. Um, no, he didn't. <laughs> you know, I love those things instinctively. Instinctively. And if I don't love something, no command is going to make me do that or change that. I hate Marmite with a passion. I hate peanut butter. If you made me eat a peanut butter sandwich or gave me Marmite on toast, you might persuade me to try it, but you're never going to make me love it. So we've got a bit of a dilemma here. And it goes on. The next verse says, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? You know, I feel for this guy now. He's really feeling the heat, isn't he? He's really feeling the weight of what Jesus has said to him. So he's trying to find a framework. He's trying to find a mechanism. He's trying to find a box he can put this into. Remember, at this point, this guy's primary concern is still all about himself. Here's dilemma number two. How do I earn this? If you think you have to earn your way to heaven, then every good thing I do or you do is actually operating from a self-interest. What I'm saying actually is I'm loving you to love me. I am loving you to love me. And this is the whole point of Jesus' life. If you don't know Jesus this morning, this is the whole point of Jesus' life. We can never earn our way to heaven so Jesus had to come to earth and earn it for me. And so the man is now waiting to hear Jesus' response to the question. And Jesus does what he does so brilliantly. He starts to tell a story that subtly starts to shift the question. I wish I had this skill. He starts to tell this story that subtly shifts the question. And in the process, he shows us what it means to love beyond ourselves. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now, when he says down from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's quite literal, you know. It was, um, 
It was a 17 mile journey, which dropped about 3,000 feet. And it had all these rocky outcrops on the road, and it was an ideal place for robbers to hide. So moving on, a priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Do you know what? I've been really hard on this guy in the past. Really, really hard. I've almost pictured him like stepping over a bleeding man in the street on his way to the shopping mall in, in, in Merry Hill. That's how I've seen it. He just couldn't be bothered. He just stepped over him and carried on his way. But the people listening to Jesus would have immediately recognized some things, you know, in this story that made what the priest did more understandable. Not saying I agree with it, but make it more understandable. You see, the Jericho Road was a really dangerous path, and it was called in those days the Pass of Blood. So if you were traveling on that road, you didn't stop. You never stopped. And the priest was coming back from Jerusalem where he purified himself so he could again go back to where he was coming from and perform his religious duties. And according to Jewish law, you know, if you touched a man who had died after you'd been purified, he would have to go back to the temple, spend another seven days purifying himself, and then make the travel back. Here's the point. It would have been a really, really huge inconvenience and dangerous and expensive for that priest to help that guy. So he carried on. The next verse says, so to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him pass by on the other side. Now, Levites were like priests, just not full priests. They were like, um, like PCSOs to our policemen, if I can put it in that kind of framework. And here's the point with this dude. On this road, you can see three to four miles ahead of you. So it could have been that the Levite saw what the priest did. And he probably thought, if the priest did that, it probably isn't a good idea for me to stop. He's just following his leader. And there's a point there for me as a leader, a point there for you as leaders. If you have positions of authority or responsibility, people will follow what you do. People will follow what you do. Verse 33 says, But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. Now, this guy was a sworn enemy of the Jew. They regard as being unclean. And there was this real racial bitterness and violence sometimes going on between these two groups of people. To a Jew, you know, the only good Samaritan was a dead one. The only good Samaritan was a dead one. Even sharing bread with a Samaritan was like eating pork. That was, that was how bad it was. They didn't want anything to do with them. But you know what I found out doing this research? Samaritans weren't that great either. I found this bit of trivia out. Before the Jews had to have their big festivals, Samaritans would go and rob a load of pigs and fire them over the walls of the temple by catapults so that when they came in the next day, the very thing that would defile everything they found as they walked through the doors. How, how terrible is that? So they weren't, they weren't like, you know, there was animosity on both sides. That's what makes this story so incredible. That's what makes this story so incredible. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Do you see that? I will. I will reimburse. I will look after him. His own money. And then he leaves the bank balance open. It's like an open check. And what's the law expert's reply? The expert said, the one who had mercy on him. He can't even say the word Samaritan. He can't even say the word. And Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So this story shows us what it means to love beyond ourselves, but not why we should do it. But not why we should do it. So who should we love? Anyone we see in need. 
You know, the Samaritan and the Jew couldn't have had less in common, could they? To meet the need, the Samaritan had to overcome this incredible social barrier. And it's natural, isn't it, to help people that are like us. I don't find it a strain at all to help people that I like or that I identify with. But Jesus teaches me that we're to help those, especially those with whom I've got little in common with. Even those who might have wronged me in some way. This could mean somebody I barely know. It could mean somebody who doesn't believe the same things as I do. It could mean maybe my boss at work. He's here. How about the refugee may have broken every law to get here? It's anybody. When do I help? Whenever I see the need. And that's hard, isn't it? Because I'm really, really honest with you. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood. I'm really not in the mood. It's like I don't mind helping people who um, are really victims of some injustice sometimes. But sometimes I look at some say, well, do you really deserve my help? What have you done to deserve my help? Do you know, the Samaritan would have had plenty of reasons to believe this man deserved his suffering. He was a Jew. Yet this guy reaches out to this man in mercy. And you know, the fact that I and my brothers were born into a family with two loving parents who made sure I went to school, gave me three meals a day and a safe place to sleep every night wasn't something I earned. That was a gift. I had no control over that. That was a gift of grace. Therefore, you know, the children that find themselves not experiencing those things didn't do anything to be born there either. So why do we find ourselves isolating ourselves from people sometimes if they're in a different postcode to us? If they look different to me? If they may act through some parts of their lives differently and have different values to how I would have them? And I'm not saying here that we should be careless in how we help. Please hear me properly. We shouldn't care in a way that fosters independency, you know, or ignores their family structure. We need to, to, um, to have some acceptance and be sensitive to that. But the point is we have to do something. We can't just pass by. And Proverbs 3.27 says this. Do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in your power to act. When it is in your power to act. If we have the opportunity to act, we have the responsibility to act. So how much then? He's the killer. In a way that takes their burden onto you. In order to help, you know, that Samaritan had to put himself at great risk. He used his own money. In Galatians, in Galatians it says, bear one, another's, bear one another's burdens. We get involved to a point that it burdens me. And C.S. Lewis said this great, great quote, give more than you think you can spare until it pains you. I can be like the priest and the Levite far too often. I can read my Bible, I can tithe, I can volunteer, I can attend my connect group. And these are all really honourable and important things to do. And I'm not going to say don't do them because we need to do them. But if I look at my life, how much am I really giving myself away? The heaviest part of the thing that Jesus said to that guy was to love your neighbour as yourself and if I really want to evaluate my walk with Jesus I have to ask how much of my resource and time is poured out for somebody else so why do we love beyond ourselves and this is where Jesus turns the man's question on its head if you remember it asked it started with the expert asking what a person could do to inherit eternal life but I hope you're getting this morning that we couldn't do anything which is why Jesus puts this interesting twist on this story. Why have the Samaritan as the hero? Why not tell the story in a way where that guy, that young guy, would have everything to connect to and everything in common with the person who is offering the help? Why not say the priest and the Levite, and they know a really good living Jewish guy came by and did everything he should have done that the other two didn't? Jesus used a character that couldn't have been any more different from the guy asking the questions. And here's why I think. 
What if the person we are most supposed to identify with is not the priest or the Levite or the Good Samaritan? What if we are primarily supposed to identify with the guy bleeding on the side of the road? And what if someone who had every reason to hate me, be my enemy, someone very unlike me, furthest realm where I could ever be, chose to put himself in danger for me? What if the really good Samaritan is Jesus? Who put himself into the path of danger, who left everything he knew, took upon himself the suffering which should have been mine and poured out his resources to save me. Jesus is asking this guy, what if you were bleeding to death on the side of the road and your only hope, your only hope was an act of grace from an enemy who didn't owe you anything? After you'd been rescued like that, what would your life be like? What would your life truly be like? We don't find out what that guy's life was like after that incident, but I bet you it was changed. I bet you it was changed. You see, because Jesus isn't trying to give that rich, young, that rich law expert another new rule. He's trying to give him a completely new reality. A completely new reality. If I understand Jesus' life, I am the one saved by radical grace, by a God who had every right to feel like my enemy. And it's when I embrace that truth, and it's when you embrace that truth, you become a giver of that radical grace. And you know, the word that Jesus used, what the Samaritan felt, is the Greek word splagma. And we translate that as compassion, but you know what it really means? It means pity from your deepest soul. It's not so much an action I choose, but an emotion I shouldn't be able to control. You know, the Samaritan saw what lay in front of him. But he also saw beyond that. What lay in front of him was a guy beaten to the point of death. And it would have been so easy, like the priest and the Levite, to pass by on the other side to think he's pretty much dead anyway. But the Samaritan saw what it could be. A man that could be well. Who could be saved. Who could go on to live a happy life. And Jesus did exactly this for me. Jesus did exactly this for you. He doesn't see just my brokenness. He doesn't just see my mistakes. He doesn't just see my shame that I sometimes feel. He sees what I could be. He sees my healed heart. My fulfilled life. And the life that can live beyond myself. And at phase, you know, we're faced with children and young people who to others are seen like that bleeding man on the side of the road, who are seen like a lost cause, caught up in gang culture. Those children on the brink of being excluded early on from primary school because they just can't cope with what's going on in their world and have no way of reasoning that through or working that through. Young people exploited sexually and criminally so much that they don't even know any other way of living. And it's our job to see beyond that. To reignite hope and then to help them see that hope too. And that's what we do. And we do see that. And I could stand here all day and tell you story after story of children and lives and young people's lives that have been touched by that hope. And had something change within them. And we feel called to the broken, to the ones nobody else notices. To love them like Jesus has loved us. And that way of living isn't just for people that work for FaZe, it's for everybody in this room. And that's why this message is so much less about us and an organisation and so much more about how we are called and even commanded to live beyond ourselves. The challenge for all of us today, you know, is not just to live a life where we focus on what's best for us, but living, sometimes uncomfortably, a life beyond ourselves. Do you know, I wonder what our world would really look like if we all looked past what was in front of us and saw what could be. And it might always not look heroic and spectacular, but small choices in the everyday. Mother Teresa said this great line. She said, we can all do small things with great love. We can all do small things with great love. And sometimes, you know, we can wait for the big opportunity and miss all those small ones where we could have shown love and compassion to somebody.
God isn't after rule followers. He wants people who love like he loves, who respond like he responds. And you can't produce that from a law only by an experience of radical grace. You've heard this, haven't you? Do unto others you'd have them do unto you. I think the Apostle Paul upgrades that. To do unto others as Jesus has done for you. And those of us that have truly experienced this, you start to develop these things, don't you, where you have this impulse to be generous to people, to generous in a way that maybe you've not been before, and these insane abilities to forgive. And, uh, and we find ourselves working in that realm. And we don't love beyond ourselves because we have to do great things in order to be saved, but because something great has already been done to save us. The reality is that to love takes courage and mass the band to come back for me to love like this takes courage and it's inconvenient Martin Luther King Jr. said this about this story he said the first question the priest and the Levite asked was this If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Samaritan asked, if I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? If I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Isn't that a million dollar question? You could say to me, Jane, but my life is just so, so busy. It's rammed. You know, I've got such a full schedule. But then you're saying to me, you don't have time to engage people. And I'm speaking to myself now too. How do I make sure that I'm not always in so much of a hurry that I don't see beyond myself? Maybe we need to slow down a little. Maybe we need to stop a little bit more often. Maybe we need to talk to a few more people. Maybe listen to them a little better. Engage with people we come into contact with on the way. Jesus was so good at that, wasn't he? On the way to. On the way back. Coming from, going to. His eyes were always open for the world around him. Even beyond his circle of friends. Let's not fill up our lives with the marginal that you have no space for the essential. Maybe we need to reorder our world a little bit. And this isn't a one-time thing. This is something we need to look at quite regularly. I need to look at quite regularly. I can get quite overwhelmed sometimes with stuff that's going on in my world. And with every good intention, and I find myself working for God instead of working with Him. 